All right, so thanks everyone for hopping on today. Um, this webinar is to give you an overview of the ERP phase two program and how you might go about applying. Before we dive into the topic, I wanna do some quick Zoom housekeeping. So we are recording this webinar. It will be shared with everyone that's attending today um, as well as posted on Rafi's website a bit later this week. Um, we are in webinar settings, so everyone is automatically on mute. Um, but if you have questions that are coming up during the webinar, please put them in the, the chat box um, and we'll be gathering those throughout um, the webinar. And then we have time set aside at the end to, to go through those. So that's the best way to make sure um, you're getting your questions answered today. In terms of agenda, we'll do some quick introduction for who's on the call today, who will be providing some information, um, you know, discussing what is what is this ERP phase two program, and then getting into some of the nitty gritty details of what are what's the eligibility requirements, application forms, um, thinking about some tips and considerations for applying, um, as well as like a farmer case study scenario, so you can see some kind of real life application of how this might work. And then, like I said, we'll end with some questions and answers. So on the Rafi side, I want to thank everyone for joining. Um, we are Rafi USA. We're a, about an over 30-year-old nonprofit based in North Carolina. Our mission is challenging the root causes of unjust food systems and advocating for um, sustainable, equitable, just food systems. I listed some of our programs below, but I encourage you to go check out our website if you'd like to learn more about any of them. Um, and folks who are from RAFI on the call today include myself, Lisa Mish, I'm the Managing Director of Programs. And then we also have Otis Wright Jr. and Carolina Asate Gauzi, who are um, program staff with our Farmers of Color Network. And you can see our emails there if you have any questions and want to reach out. I'll pause there for um, Stephen and Lizzie to introduce themselves. Hi there, uh, I'm Stephen Carpenter. I'm here with my colleague, uh, Lindsay Keene. We're from Farmers Legal Action Group. Uh, Farmers Legal Action Group, or FLAG, is a nonprofit law firm uh, that works on behalf of family farmers. So we're based in Minnesota, um, but we do work uh, in a lot of places, in the Midwest, the South, uh, as well as Minnesota. And a lot of our work is with grassroots farm organizations like RAFI. And so we try to, to figure out uh, legal problems for folks trying to stay on the land or get started in farming that are uh, family farms, modestly sized farms, people who really struggle. And I, we do a, a couple of things that, uh, that are relevant for today that maybe are worth talking about. One is that we try to write materials that are useful for farmers and for farmer advocates. And that's what we've done for this disaster program, ERP2 as, as people call it. Um, we are just about to finish uh, a big long guide to ERP2, which will have all of the details, every eligibility point, um, and that will be on our website at Farmers Legal Action Group. And Lindsay and I will will put that um, in the chat as well as our email contact information. And so today we're just going to try to hit the very high points in, in what we say, but we really encourage you to follow up with questions with us and to check out the guide. It's dry as dust, as we always say, but it's it's written from a, a farmer's perspective and it's got the details. So you, we hope that you can get the firm answer to questions that you have about the guide, about the program. Um, Lindsay, uh, further introduction? All right, for now, I will just say hello, everyone. My name is Lindsay Keen. As Stephen said, I work at FLAG as well, and um, I'm going to be picking up the second half of our presentation. So, Stephen, I'll turn it back to you. Great. And, and I mentioned that we work with a, a lot with grassroots farm organizations, and I just wanted to say that among the most important of those organizations, organizations is RAFI. You know, there are a lot of farm groups in the country, but very few of them 
come close to matching what Rafi does in um, in really assisting farmers who have a hard time for fighting for equality in farm country. And they've been at it a very, very long time. And it's really a, a privilege and a pleasure to, uh, to be working with Rafi. So with that, um, we're gonna get started. I'm gonna talk a little bit about ERP2 program. And then Lindsay will pick up after that. Uh, feel free to have questions at the end. And I'll say again, follow up with us later. <clears throat> so for this brief part of the discussion, I was hoping to do to talk about two or three things. One is what is really the logic of this program? What's what's kind of the point here? Second of all, what's the eligibility rule that applies for farmers? Um, what is the eligibility for crops? And something that USDA calls linkage, that is to say uh, a requirement that you're gonna need to meet if you participate in the program. And then for a further discussion, I'll hand it over to Lindsay and then for some real um, excellent sort of actually, how does this work uh, guidance, uh, it, we will turn to Rafi. So the emergency relief program, um, what is the logic of this and why would it uh, warrant so much attention from us here at FLAG and at RAFI? Here's the deal. This is a disaster program. Uh, USDA has a lot of disaster programs and has had them for a long time. The problem is that most disaster programs work really well if you're a large operation that grows one of the handful of crops that, um, that these programs favor. So, if you do corn and soybeans, you do cotton, um, disaster programs and crop insurance work really well for you. They don't work as well if you have a number of different crops, if you are organic as a producer, if you um, sell at a farmer's market or do other direct marketing. These programs have generally not been meant for you. And so ERP2 is an effort to try to make uh, the program, the disaster program, more relevant for uh, these other folks who tend not to, to be benefited. Um, that said, and so, and it does that by sort of saying, how did the disaster affect your revenue? That's the sort of the core question here is, how did it help hit your revenue? And that, but the complicated part is how you, you figure out the details. So, and that's why we're here. So that's sort of the logic of this. And that's, that's why Rafi and FLAG and other organizations think it's really important to try to understand. Because even if you're not usually a USDA person, uh, this program might be helpful to you. So again, it's a disaster program, you're gonna have eligibility rules. And so the eligibility rules for farmers are that you can be an individual person. Obviously you can also be uh, what lawyers call an entity. Um, you can have an LLC, you can do these other things that, um, you know, that aren't just an individual person, those are fine. So you can be eligible doing that. Um, you don't have to have ever dealt with USDA before, this can be the first time, or, you know, you can have, you can have done it many times in the past. Um, you do need to have uh, an ownership interest in the crop. You can't just be a landlord, for example. You need to be the actual farmer and you need to be raising a crop that you intend to sell commercially. So home consumption, uh, we'll talk about it in a second, forage, you know, where you're really just, let's say, growing things to feed your, raising hay to feed your cattle, that you can't, you're not eligible for that. It needs to be something you intended to sell. So the crop eligibility, there are only certain crops that you can do for ERP2. Um, and they, the USDA has divided them up into three different types. And it's a little tricky. Uh, I'm just gonna sort of spell them out here. And the differences, unfortunately, affect how you get paid. So the first group that USDA divides people, crops into for the emergency relief program are what they call specialty crops. And that has a sort of definition that we usually hear for specialty crops, fruits and vegetables. The second group that they divide people in their crops into is what USDA calls high value crops. 
And so that's your everyday crop, but that you get an additional um, premium on top of what might normally be the price for that crop. So if you grow organic, if you sell, you know, you raise tomatoes, but you sell them in a farmer's market, for example, you're going to get more per pound per bushel, however you want to measure it. If you at a farmer's market, then you would if you sold them to a cannery or something like that. So you have this sort of category of high value crops where you're getting more than the average all across America because you're doing something special. And then third category is they just say other. And that's as you might think, that's sort of kind of everything else. The reality is that crop a wide variety of crops are available for ERP too. Um, a couple of things are not eligible. As I mentioned before, um, a crop that you raise that's intended to be grazed, um, so pasture, um, or if you would just tend to feed it to your own livestock or animals, you know, that's not eligible. You need to have intended to sell it. There's also kind of a tricky rule. Some aquatic production is not eligible. We explain that in our guide. Um, and we can talk about it if you have a question, but it's, you know, it's a broad range of crops are eligible, but some aquatic crops are not. So as we mentioned, it's a disaster program. Um, and that means there needs to have been a disaster to be eligible. And so USDA has a list of disasters that qualify, that help qualify for the program. It's a long list. It's not every possible thing. But things that you would normally associate with a disaster, a hurricane, a flood, et cetera, they're in there. Um, there. There can be a few tricky definitions, but by and large, if you had a drought, if you had what we normally think of as a disaster, you're probably going to qualify. And again, our guide uh, breaks it down in, um, as I say, dry as dust detail if you're if you're sort of on the edge there or concerned about whether you qualify for a disaster. Lindsay's gonna talk about uh, how this all adds up together in terms of eligibility, the one and, and how you would get paid. The one thing that I wanted to add that is sort of an oddity, and that is that if you apply for this program, there's what USDA calls a linkage requirement. Linkage, what in the world is that? Basically what it means is that if you participate in ERP2, USDA is going to make you try to buy crop insurance for the next two years. So let's say you will stick with tomatoes. Let's say you raised tomatoes, you had a disaster loss and you used ERP2 to, to help get paid for, for, from your loss on your tomatoes. The rules for this program say you must try to buy crop insurance for the next two years for tomatoes. Um, if, it, as we know, crop insurance is not available for every crop um, for, um, in every county. So, and we also know that you know th this is a program which is not really designed for people who usually get crop insurance. So this is an important piece of the puzzle when you're trying to figure out whether, how to, uh, to use this program. So if you can't, if crop insurance is not available, you are forced to try to apply for what's called NAP, Non-Insurable Crop Assistance Program. So the acronym is NAP, NAP. And it's sort of a mini crop insurance run by USDA. And you, so you're going to have to, in our tomato example, if you can't get crop insurance, you need to apply for a NAP. It's sort of its own disaster program that you, you pay into. If your NAP is not available to you, you need to buy, try to buy a special form of crop insurance called a full farm revenue. Um, if you get there and you, that gets confusing, send us an email. We'd be happy to try to help you figure out how to meet those requirements. So it basically, you're gonna to have to do this for two years. There are a couple of important exceptions. One is if you don't grow the crop, you don't have to buy crop insurance for it or NAP or whole farm. Um, so let's say you, in our tomato example, you decide not to grow tomatoes for the next couple of years. Um, you're, you, know, you don't have to buy crop insurance for tomatoes. But one thing to remember here, which is hard is that you, 
you have to buy a fairly high level of crop insurance. So the expense of the crop insurance is really going to matter to people. It's something to figure. It's something to figure out. And and uh, as we know, I mean, if you got crop insurance to to begin with, there, it's a very good chance you're not in this program at all. So it's it's a new it's a new tricky thing. So uh, how about getting paid and how that works? Lindsay, please take over. Thanks, Stephen. Um, so I'm gonna, before I get into kind of how the program calculates a payment, I do just wanna build up something Stephen mentioned. So obviously we are here today talking about ERP phase two. And as the name suggests, there was an ERP phase one. And I just wanna make very clear, they are separate programs and they were structured very differently. So whereas this program, as Stephen mentioned, is based on revenue losses, and it's really intended for people who may not have had crop insurance. Phase one, and some of you might be aware of this or maybe even received a phase one payment, phase one was structured really for only for farmers who received a crop insurance indemnity or a payout from NAP. And so that is one of the, the biggest differences Phase one closed in December of last year, so it is no longer an eligible program for folks. So that is why we are focusing on phase two. But I want to make very clear that even if you are someone who re received a phase one payment, you can still be eligible for phase two. So everything we're talking about, um, it is possible that it still applies to you even if you received a payment from the phase one program. Uh, so I think, you know, yeah, a lot of farmers, the biggest question is, you know, is it going to be worth my time to fill out this application um, to figure out if I'm eligible? You know, so what it, what does the payment look like? So I'm going to do my best to try to initially kind of simplify it down. I think one thing about this program, kind of the logic of it, when you step back, seems to make sense and seems, you know, rather simple. But there are a lot of terms that FSA uses, and they have very specific definitions, and it's quite easy to get into the weeds. So I'm going to try to avoid that as best I can. But also, as um, Stephen said, feel free to reach out to us or to Rafi with any particular questions, and we're happy to, you know, go further into those weeds with you. Um, okay, so I'm going to dive right into these payments. So essentially what phase two payments are trying to reflect is a farmer's loss in revenue between what they call a benchmark year. So let's just say your typical farming year um, when compared to a year where a disaster struck and you maybe suffered a crop loss. So it's trying to account for that difference. Um, a couple, or one thing to note, I suppose, right off the bat, the way FSA is um, handling payments for this program, they're actually doing them in two installments. So a first installment, an initial payment, um, in some cases they've already gone out to farmers who have applied, but it is going to be at a maximum of $2,000 or what the farmer's total phase two payment would be calculated to be. So for example, if you're a farmer who applies for the program and you're only eligible for a total payment of 1500, you might get that entire payment as your initial payment and then it would sort of be done. Um, but if you're a farmer, let's say you believe you might be eligible for a $10,000 payment, the most you're gonna receive right away is that $2,000. And the reason for this, at least according to FSA is you know, this is a program that does not have unlimited funding. And so they are unsure what the interest will be or how much money they would need to actually fully fund the program. So by doing an initial payment, they are giving themselves, I guess I would say the wiggle room to sort of reduce the final payments if there's not enough, um, not enough money in the program to pay out everyone at the full, you know, what they would, it otherwise be eligible for. So, you know, when the program closes uh, in early June, if it turns out they have enough money to pay everyone, then great, everyone will receive, you know, the full uh, payment for the program. But if it turns out there's not enough money in the program, then they will prorate the payments. And so the second installment, that second payment might be less than what um, you think when you apply. So I just want to make that clear. Um, and then as far as how that total payment is calculated, what FSA has chosen to do, so like I mentioned a moment ago, farmers have to choose 
a, um, a benchmark year. And this is gonna be generally either calendar year, year 2018 or 2019. The farmer can pick. It's supposed to represent your typical year of revenue. And what will happen then is that they will take that revenue and multiply it by what they call, and this is where some of the jargon comes in, but an ERP factor. Um, essentially, this program is not intended to make any farmers whole entirely. So they are starting off by reducing your typical year revenue. And in this case, um, the default is a 70% payment factor. So they're going to reduce that right off the bat. Um, and after that, then there's just a series of things that um, FSA will subtract. The first is, you know, from that benchmark year revenue with the 70% reduction, they're going to then subtract um, your disaster year revenue. So, for example, if you had $100,000 revenue, you know, in calendar year 2019, and then you had, due to the disaster, you only had 50000 in revenue, they would take that, you know, they would subtract that $50,000. Um, FSA will also subtract any payments that a farmer has received from similar programs. So programs that might have aimed at um, accounting for these losses. And um, we know that ERP phase one is gonna be one of them. And also because as all of us are aware, you know, we went through several years of a pandemic where the government created different programs and USDA did specifically for agriculture like CFAP or the 2020 WIP program. And so any payments that a farmer received from those programs will also be subtracted. Um, and so, uh, so that is how essentially you've got your benchmark year and you're subtracting the revenue from your disaster year and then any other payments that you received for similar losses. And that is essentially amounts to the, um, the ERP payment. So that's the overall structure of it. Now, a few things that I, I kind of want to go into, um, or at least flag for folks, just in case, um, you know, you might have future questions as you get more into this. Um, one thing to think about is what counts as allowable gross revenue. Um, and I imagine Rafi's going to go into this a bit with their example. But I will say that FSA has done a pretty good job of providing resources to help walk farmers through what counts. Um, I think one kind of quirk with this program and something to point out is, let's say you raised 10 crops, but only a couple of them suffered losses due to a disaster. Um, when you're calculating your gross revenue, you actually, you're gonna take your revenue from all eligible crops, not just the ones that suffered um, because of a disaster. So that's something that's maybe a little counterintuitive or, or might seem not quite as logical off the bat. So I wanna make that clear. Um, the other thing that's important and it's something that makes this program a little different is this is not, you know, your revenue is not just the standard sale of your raw commodities. So this program allows you to account for um, value added project products as long as the farmer you yourself grew the underlying um, commodity or crop. So for example, if you raise strawberries and you turn them into jam, you can use the, you can count the revenue from that jam, not just the strawberries when you're calculating your revenue for your benchmark and disaster years. So that is something I think that's important to think about. Um, and I will say, you know, on FSA's website, they, and even on the application itself, there is a separate form that allows you that kind of goes through and points out exactly what can be counted as revenue and what's excluded. And a lot of these things for farmers who file a Schedule F, a lot of them come from your Schedule F, but it's really important to know you do not have to have filed a Schedule F or any you know, similar tax form to apply for this program. If you did, it might make it easier to calculate your allowable revenue, but it is not a requirement. So I would keep that in mind. Um, okay, a couple other um, just details about, again, how that payment calculation works. As I mentioned, the benchmark year is going to be typically either year 2018 or 2019. But some of you and maybe some of you on this call might be newer farmers. And I just want to flag it that it is possible for farmers who um, began farming after 2019, it is possible that you are still eligible for this program. And um, FSA has a way to sort of adjust 
what a benchmark year revenue would look like. So I just wanna make it clear that even if you're a new farmer, that doesn't mean that you can't apply. And similarly, as we all know, you know, farms evolve, they change for a variety of reasons. So if 2018 or 2019, if those years do not represent your typical year anymore, maybe you sold land or maybe you bought land. So if your operation increased or decreased in size, um, there is also a way to account for that when you're applying. And I believe at least I might be going into that in a little more detail in a few minutes. So just wanna make sure everyone's aware that even if you had these changes, you can still apply. There's just kind of a separate step to take. Um, and then the only other detail about this payment structure I wanna point out when we think of the disaster year, right? So the year we're comparing your typical year to. In general, you know, this program only accounts for disasters that occurred in calendar years 2020 and 2021. However, as we all know, some crops you might plant in one calendar year, but you might not sell them or see the revenue until the following year. So when we talk about comparing that typical year revenue to your disaster year revenue, it is possible, for example, um, let's say you planted winter wheat in the fall of 2021 and there was a flood that winter. Um, so that would be an eligible disaster in 2021, but you might choose to use the revenue from 2022 when you apply because that was the year that you actually as a farmer experienced the loss in revenue. So um, I wanted, wanted to make that clear. Uh, okay, so those are a few things about the payment calculation. In the last few minutes, I want to talk briefly about the type of documentation that you might need for this program. Um, it's important to know that really when you actually apply, and Rafi's going to go over this, there are only two documents, two FSA forms that you'll need to submit, um, but there are about four other documents that you will need to provide to FSA within 60 days after when you apply. So it's okay if by this June deadline, you don't have these four documents ready. Um, and for some of them, if they're already on file with FSA, if you're a farmer who's worked with USDA in the past, then you might not need to refile them. But I'm just gonna briefly mention, one is um, USDA's, it's their customer data sheet, it's form AD2047. It, it just, uh, it asks for information about you, about your farm, your tax ID, just some basic um, personal information. There's also, you'll need to submit within 60 days, a farm operating plan. That's form CCC902. Um, and there is, you know, for most USDA programs and anyone who's participated, there are requirements, conservation requirements that you have to comply with. Um, for ERP phase two, that's no different. So the form that certifies that you are in compliance with those rules is 801026. Um, and again, if you already have that form on file with FSA, you don't need to resubmit it. And then finally, if you are a farmer who is considering applying for this program as an entity, um, there is the member information for legal entities form that you would need to submit, and that's CCC 901. So I just want to let you know, those are the only additional required forms. You have 60 days to submit them. Um, and you know, there, it is possible though, that even though the required documentation seems quite minimal, what FSA does say and what you do certify to when you apply for this program is that you will have supporting documentation that shows that you experienced the revenue loss you're saying you did. So you need to, if FSA requests for addi additional documentation, you know, you need to be prepared to, to provide that. Um, so I would keep that in mind. And, um, Finally, I want to point out, you know, as with a lot of USDA programs, it's important to understand that um, you do have appeal rights with ERP phase two. So if you apply and if you are denied a program payment or if it is less than what you think it, it should be, um, there are specific rules that allow you to appeal that or to seek what's called equitable relief. And um, we will mention those in more details in our guide, or if you find yourself in that situation, please feel free to reach out to us and we can help you navigate that. 
And um, the very last thing I want to point out, and Stephen and I, you know, I think we say this at all of our, um, any kind of talk we have, especially related to USDA or FSA, but we just want to point out that, you know, farmers uh, come, right, all genders, all races, all socioeconomic backgrounds, and it is illegal for USDA to discriminate. And so if you, through this process, um, feel that you endure any sort of discrimination, just know that that is legal under the law and there is actually a discrimination complaint process with USDA. Um, we have written about that. We are happy to talk to any farmers um, for whom um, that might become necessary. So uh, with that, I think, Lisa, am I turning it over to you right now for a kind of more hands-on example? Yes. Uh, that, that's great. I uh, just want to let people know we, we did have some questions already coming to the chat that we've been answering, um, answering it, but we can also kind of summarize that at the end uh, and continue to do so, add questions there. Um, I, don't, I don't know if we mentioned it yet, but the due date for this program is June 2nd. So it's coming up, there's still time, um, but that's, that's the, the date in mind. Um, and if you're listening to you know, that information and like we're trying to write things down or trying to keep straight all those different form names, I wanna mention that Rafi also has a blog post up on our website that has all that information that was already stated as, you know, what is ERP, the different eligibility. Um, we'll call that like a mid-tier information. The guide that Flag has produced would be like your real detail. Like if you wanted to know a specific thing, that's where you would go for that. Um, uh, but the blog post is a, another good resource to get kind of a general overview of what did she mean by like allowable gross income? You know, what were the different forms? Um, so I wanted to mention that now. All right, let me share my screen again. All right, so next I wanted to just summarize again some of um, the considerations if you're thinking about applying, maybe some tips um, and just kind of solidify some of the information that was uh, stated before. Um, so because you need to have a, a really clear idea of, you know, what did, what was my revenue in the disaster year? What was my revenue in a benchmark year? Having clear firm financial and tax records is going to make your life a lot easier um, when pulling together those, those calculations. Um, so if you're thinking like, oh, it might take me a while to find all this information before June 2nd, maybe it's not, this isn't the, uh, a good opportunity to apply. But if you have those numbers at the ready, then the actual application form, pretty straightforward. Um, so something to consider. Um, like we've already mentioned, making sure you have a disaster that has happened in one of the eligible years, so 2020, 2021, and it's an eligible disaster, and that you are using your um, disaster revenue that is reflected in the correct tax year. So like Lindsay said, if you sold your crop in 2022 uh, for a 2021 crop damage, that's the tax year you would use to represent that revenue. You also want to consider um, whether you would need to do an adjusted allowable gross revenue calculation in order to fill out this form. Um, so like was mentioned, if you're a new producer, if you didn't have any income in 2018, 2019, you would definitely need to do that adjusted calculation. Um, other situations would be if you had an increase or decrease in operational capacity. So what that means is, you know, it'd be thinking about like, did I have a change in production acreage, um, you know, that really influenced my capacity, my overall operation capacity. Um, it could also be, you know, are you using modified production techniques? Like you added irrigation, which really increased the efficiency and production um, level of your farm. Um, or do you have new inventory? Like you had a, a greenhouse or a hoop house that ended up coming down uh, between years and that kind of, again, affected your um, operational capacity. So those would be the situations to consider um, what, uh, you know, thinking about 2018, 2019, 2020, 2021, does this apply to you? Um, the, there's a little extra work to do that adjusted calculation, which I'll explain in a bit as well. Um, and then Lindsay's already mentioned the 2000 um, maximum payment cap, but I'll say that again, that's, you know, what you would initially get with the assumption that 
you know, hopefully there's going to be a second payment um, coming later. Another thing to mention is um, USDA has created this tool that's available on their website, and we can try to put that link in the chat as well. Um, that is a downloadable spreadsheet that helps helps farmers work through these calculations precisely. So especially if you need to do that adjusted um, revenue calculation, the spreadsheet might be useful to kind of think through, okay, how many acres were affected or you know what what was my um, price per bushel of a commodity? Like it, it works to that pretty uh, formulaically. Um, just getting in contact with your FSA office if you are thinking about applying and talking about the forms and how to fill them out. That's always a, a good um, practice and they are there to help you. So um, that's a resource to, to use. Um, Lindsay also mentioned that this is a self-certifying um, application. So you don't need to send in photos showing that you had crops that were damaged when you do this application. That's not necessary. Um, but if a county committee gets your application and they see something that they want to follow up on, that's their, their right to do and they can verify it, that information. So be mindful of that. Um, and I also wanted to mention, um, Stephen talked about this linkage requirement that you, you're required to um, acquire some sort of crop insurance. Um, and I wanted to mention that you may be eligible for a low or no cost um, kind of risk management tool. Um, thinking about NAP, there's a basic NAP coverage. Um, if you identify a beginning farmer, socially disadvantaged, um, low resource or veteran farmer, and there's particular definitions for all those things. Um, but if you think that you fall under one of those categories, you, um, the, the, the fee for getting a nap is waived um, and there's no premium cost for nap. So it's it's basically like a no cost option. So if you heard that and thought, well, I can't pay for crop insurance, um, there may be still ways to um, affordably cover that requirement. Okay, and then next I wanted to do kind of a, a scenario of well, what, what would this look like? Um, like looking at your situation and translating that into an application. So this is a simplified example and this operation and the numbers are not based in reality, but hopefully it, it helps to explain kind of how this might come together. So in this example, farmer Pat grows pinto beans and corn, kind of generic field corn, um, as well as raises cattle. Both of these crops were damaged in 2020 due to hurricane related winds. Uh, and both the beans and the corn were sold in 2020. So that revenue came in 2020. Income from the cattle is not affected. Uh, Farmer Pat considers 2019 to be a benchmark revenue year for that operation. Um, and there was no change in operational capacity between those two years, the static. So the next thing would be to kind of bring together some of this financial information and the calculations. So first looking at what was the actual disaster year revenue in 2020 when this disaster occurred? Pulls together the information, finds that there was 200,000 in uh, bean revenue, 150 for corn, cattle was 75,000. So if we were going to calculate the ERP disaster year revenue, we're only going to consider the beans and the corn because those are the eligible commodities, the cattle is ineligible. So that would be 350,000. Next up, we're thinking about the benchmark revenue. Um, so what happened in a typical year of production? Uh, so again, Farmer Pat goes back in financial and tax records and finds that um, revenue from 2019 was 275,000 for beans, 260 for corn, cattle was 85,000. Um, so again, only considering beans and corn in the um, allowable gross revenue, 535,000. And finally, there needs to be some calculations around expected disaster year revenue, because um, there's a part in the form where you're breaking down percentage of expected revenue between um, different types of crops. Explain that. So expected disaster year revenue is what a farmer expected to, what farmer got expected to make in 2020 if this disaster had not occurred. So again, there's some calculations thinking about, you know, your acreage, how many you know, bushels or units of measurement you expected from an acre, expected price, 
per unit, and then that would get you kind of the expected revenue. So as worked through those calculations, came up with 300,000 for beans, 250 for corn, um, 75 for cattle. Um, so then these two numbers that are relate to um, sections on the form are expected revenue from specialty high value crops uh, versus other crops. So 55% um, would be the 300,000 from the pinto beans, um, 45 from the corn. So this is the FSA 521 form. This is the application, um, the main application for the ERP program. And I've only highlighted this specific section of the form where these calculations come into play. Um, so we are looking at part C, which is the 2020 disaster revenue certification. Um, you see part D would be for 2021. So the main section here is five through 10. And in this second um, slide, show where some of these numbers plug in. So we had 55% for specialty high value crops, uh, 45 expected revenue from other crops. Our benchmark here was 2019. Our benchmark revenue was 535,000. Um, and our representative year for the disaster was 2020. The disaster year revenue was 350,000. So that's how the numbers would get filtered in. You would sign it, that's it. I also want to just do a quick example of, you know, what, what if it's adjusted? What do you have to do adjusted? So thinking of the same situation before, same parameters, except we're saying Farmer Pat rented 25 additional acres in 2020 um, for pinto bean production, let's say, um, that weren't farmed in 2019. So this indicates an increase in operational capacity between the benchmark and the disaster year. So how does this change things? This means that form FSA 521A would get filled out, which is the worksheet that calculates that adjusted um, gross revenue. Again, I'm only showing portions, but this section B is where you would indicate kind of why you need to adjust. Either you're a new producer, you had a decrease in capacity, or you had an increase. So that applies to number eight. Um, if you check yes, it says, it clarifies which sections of the form you need to fill out. Um, and I won't show all the sections, but I'll skip to section J, which is kind of a summary of those calculations further up in the form. Um, so <laughs> what you're doing, 47 is total actual allowable benchmark year revenue. That's the number that we already calculated before. That is what was at the revenue that actually came in in 2019. The new part of this that comes in is you want to estimate what the expected revenue would have been from the 25 additional acres if that had been in play in 2019. So, and then it's, it's divided between different types of commodities, value added, yield based, inventory, but that's that's all the same thing in principle. You're, you're kind of estimating what you might've gotten from that additional increased capacity. Um, and then 51 is the sum of those two numbers. So what you might've gotten if all those acreage um, numbers had been in play in 2019. So again, playing with hypothetical numbers, um, we already calculated the 535,000 um, from 2019, which was the actual revenue. If through calculations, Farmer Pat decide, or calculated that there was $35,000 that would, would have been expected revenue if that 25 acres had been in play in 2019, that means that the adjusted amount is 570,000. So the form below would stay the same for five and six, seven would become adjusted instead of 2019, and that would include that 570,000 in box eight. Okay, that, that's it. I hope that clarified instead of muddy things, but that's how some of the calculations um, migrate to parts in the form. Um, before we switch to questions and, and open it up, um, wanted to do a quick review of the resources and technical assistance that's available. Um, so FLAG has already mentioned, they have a guidebook. Is that, is it published? Is it forthcoming? Um, what is the status? 
We're wrapping it up right now um, by the end of the week for sure. Awesome. Um, so we'll, we'll try to send out an email um, with the recording of that link. We have the blog post that we mentioned. Rafi is working on um, solidifying like a eligibility quiz, like a quick couple questions that um, give you a sense of, you know, am I eligible? And, um, you know, might I be well set up to submit an application by the deadline? Um, and Rafi is also available for one-on-one -on -one technical assistance. So say you're in this call, you think, okay, maybe this, this works for me, maybe not. You just want to talk about it more. Um, you can reach out to us. Um, and maybe I'd ask Caroline and Otis to put their emails um, and our phone numbers in the chat um, as, as a point of connection. Um, all right. And then I think we can move to Q&A. So I haven't been looking at the chat recently, but what questions remain unanswered that we want to hit on? So actually, hi, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, so actually we have some questions on the chat. Uh, some of them have been answered, but uh, so uh, someone asked if oysters are eligible and Stephen uh, answered, they need to qualify as aquaculture. That means must be raised as a commercial operator in a controlled environment. So that's a very good question. Would this recorder be available? It will be available and we'll, we're going to share it with you. Uh, if there happen to have been qualifying disasters in both 2018 and 2019, which impacted income, are there any ways to account for that in calculating the benchmark? Yes, you can apply for phase two if you suffered a crop loss from disasters in both 22 and 21. The application will require that you select a benchmark year for each disaster year. You can use the same benchmark here for both disaster years if you would like. Uh, if you had a crop loss in 2002, you aren't eligible, correct? So that it's correct, not for this phase. Uh, for this phase, it's just crop losses in 2002 and 2001. Is the pandemic a disaster? It is not a disaster in the disaster list. So yes, unfortunately, nothing that has to do with the pandemic, it just uh, would be uh, applicable for this one, for, for ERP phase two. Uh, and there is uh, another question for Tomilia. What about the weather conditions like adverse weather that compromised the hoop house and had crop losses from wind exposure and flooding? flooding. In addition to the list of qualifying disasters, that is drought, derecho, excessive heat, excessive moisture, flooding, freeze, hurricanes, smog exposure, uh, winter storms, and wildfires, FSA allows a farmer to apply for ERP phase two if a loss has was caused by what they call a related condition to the disaster. The key is that the related conditions have to have been caused by the disaster. For example, sleet and debris are related conditions to flooding. So you would be eligible if sleet or debris caused your crop loss. So those are the questions that we have answered. And there is another question here. If we, if any one of you wants to to answer it, I work with. It is from Eva. I work with farmers across the state and don't know offhand where qualifying disasters may or may not have occurred in 20, uh, 2020 or 2021. Is there a single website or other source where we can quickly determine where and when those disasters occur? Does any one of you of the panelists want to answer this one? I can give an initial go and then anyone else can hop in. So, you know, what's interesting with this program, sometimes USDA programs require, you know, certain proof of a disaster and you do need to have suffered a disaster. But with this, um, the list, there's a list of about, I don't know, a dozen or so qualifying disasters. And 
you, I think the farmer would probably know, for example, if there was a flood that happened, you know, there's not a website that's going to tell you when flooding for these counties, you know, occurred. Um, the only, uh, the only time that a farmer will need to be able to, I suppose, verify with, um, data, well, I'm making this more confusing than it needs to be. There's a list for drought. So on FSA's website for ERP phase two, you either certify that you suffered a loss from these disasters like a tornado or a winter storm, or in the case of drought, you have to be in a county that is listed and they have links for the 2020 and 2021 areas that were affected by droughts, but you have to be listed in one of those counties, but that's only for drought. For the other qualifying disaster events, it's enough if the farmer says, yes, there was a winter storm that caused me to suffer a crop loss. Um, so I know that's maybe a little less helpful, um, but it is just important to know that for drought, and I can, I can put a link in the chat um, where you can go on FSA's website, and then it in turn will have links to 2020 and 2021 for drought. But for other qualifying disasters, if the farmer says it happened, um, that should be enough. There's no other list they need to cross verify with. If anyone else wants to make that answer simpler, please have a go. I'm happy with that answer. Any other questions from folks? Uh, now's the time to add it to the Q&A box. Um, and while maybe some folks are typing things in there, I wanted to mention um, we have a poll, uh, like two quick poll questions just to get some feedback from you all of how this information was. Um, Carolina, if, if you're able to launch that, um, it should be in polls and then uh, webinar evaluation. Great. So Robert, I'm going to uh, open your audio, okay? You can unmute yourself if you want to talk. That's a good thing to mention. If you, if you have a question you want to ask over audio, raise your hand and Carolina will allow you so you can unmute yourself and ask it directly. Robert, if you wanna mute yourself, eh, you would just have to click on, on your microphone and you can already talk. It also looks like Benita's hand is up, so maybe we can. Mm -hmm. So Benita, do you want to unmute yourself? Please. There it is. Okay. So really important question. The pandemic is not considered a disaster on this particular uh, grant. But in, in all throughout, it has been considered a disaster. Why uh, it's not considered a, a disaster? Do you know? I know you guys are just trying to help us get through and put in that application. But because it was such a major disaster for most farmers in 20 and 20, 20 and 21, it was like the major disaster for the majority of farmers. That's why I was so surprised to hear it's not something. Um, maybe, maybe just share your logic. I'm not trying to change, but I just can't understand that the logic behind not having that uh, that major major disaster across all all lines not to be included. 
Thank you. And yes, and thank you, Rafi. Really, really, really appreciate everything you do, all the assistance you have given to us small farmers, and especially us here in the Virgin Islands. We're normally forgotten, but you guys always remember us and really appreciate all the work being done. Thank you. Thank you for that shout out. Um, if I was channeling USDA logic and Stephen and Lindsay hop in, um, the, I think the logic would be that there have been COVID specific relief programs that have come out over the last few years. So CFAP is the one that comes to mind, um, which I can't even remember which year that occurred anymore. I think it was 2021 or 2022. Um, but that was the coronavirus food assistance program that was specifically for um, you know, revenue impacts due to COVID. Um, so since that program happened, payments have been made, they've been closed out. Um, and that, that was kind of the window of opportunity and the funding for uh, ERP came from an emergency relief assistance plan where it, it was you know, language from um, congressional uh, representatives that this was for crops, trees, bushes, vines. And so it's, it's in the, like the legislation that that's the, um, the focus area. Um, so I think that's where they're coming from that, you know, we, we had this program, that was the opportunity for you to get money. Uh, that's not to say that, um, you know, everything was done to do outreach and assistance for farmers to access CFAP, um, but that's what I'd say. Um, Lindsay, Steve, anything you'd add to that? I don't think that's exactly right. I mean, USDA would say, well, we already did that. So, and th this is for, na for natural disasters. You can kind of blame Congress too. I mean, con Congress said this is for natural disasters. Um, and I think I saw, one, okay, if there was one other question that came in the Q&A, is flooding caused by a storm, storm not a named hurricane uh, in Puerto Rico eligible? So flooding that was caused by a storm and not a named hurricane. I can, um, I think Stephen might be checking too. So for, you're right. So to qualify as one of the primary disaster events, a hurricane has to be named. But what the rules do say is that you can also qualify if the hurricane caused excessive wind, storm surges, which one could argue might be flooding, um, tornadoes, tropical storms, or depressions. So if any of those additional things resulted from a named hurricane, uh, then that would count. So now, and Stephen, you might have a thought on this. Um, I think a storm surge might qualify as a flood. That's kind of a gray area. The rules don't um, specifically say flooding. However, flooding itself is one of the um, qualifying disaster events. So you don't, you know, you don't even need a hurricane to qualify if you just had flooding, regardless of whether it was from a hurricane or something else. So I think you should absolutely be eligible um, or consider applying if a flood is what caused a crop loss, um, as long as it happened in um, 2020 or 2021. Great. Um, I don't see any other questions at the moment. Um, Carolina, has there been some responses in the poll? Do we want to close that out? I don't know what the controls look like there, so. All right, well, I think if there's no other questions, we'll go ahead and wrap up. And we're right at um, you know, a minute before 1.30 anyways. Um, like I said, we'll be sending out an email later this week with a link to the recording and some of the resources that have been mentioned. Um, but I wanna thank you all for joining today. Um, please again, see um, Rafi or Flag as a resource for any other questions. Um, and appreciate, appreciate y'all being here. Appreciate Flag for being here. Um, and yeah, we'll we'll be in touch soon with some follow-up information.
Thank you.